at lesson three in a five-part series on the topic of marriage, divorce, and redemption. Marriage, divorce, and redemption. The first message in the series, as you'll remember, came from the second chapter of Genesis, and it was there in the second chapter of Genesis that we saw God's divine intent for marriage, that marriage is a covenant of companionship in which there is relational exclusivity and sexual exclusivity. Those are the terms of that covenant of companionship. We learned last week that this covenant of companionship can be broken. It can be severed through a divorce. And a divorce can be legal, but not necessarily moral. That is, a divorce legally severs the covenant of companionship, although it may not be the moral thing to do. We learned as well last week that the Old Testament speaks about divorce in in a number of different places. Really, four different ways were given to us last week to think about the topic in the Old Testament. And those ways were that we saw some instances in which divorce was regulated in the Old Testament. We saw some instances in which divorce was required in the Old Testament. We saw some instances in which divorce was repugnant in the Old Testament. And finally, we saw an instance where divorce was representative of God's dealing with his chosen people, Israel. So we arrive at the third message this morning, and in this message we are going to see what Jesus says concerning the subject of divorce and remarriage. So we have moved out of the Old Testament, we are moving now into the New. What does Jesus say about divorce and remarriage? And we want to look at that so that we can continue to build a biblical and comprehensive and thus God-honoring understanding of this very, very difficult topic. This morning we're going to look at a number of passages found in the Gospels in which Jesus addresses the topic of divorce. Before we turn to the Gospels, though, I need to give you some background information, some kind of general overview information that will be helpful because it's running in the background of all of these Gospel passages. So let me just give you a few things that you need to keep in mind. First, in Judaism, only the man could initiate a divorce. So you can keep that in mind. Only the man could initiate a divorce in first century Judaism. Secondly, the divorce controversy as it swirls around in the Gospels swirls around the meaning of that term in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1 that we looked at last week. That very difficult term that is translated in the New American Standard as an indecency or literally the nakedness of a thing. The understanding that that underlies these gospel encounters of the topic of divorce, the understanding is, was that the law unquestionably allowed divorce on almost any grounds. The difference being not as to what was lawful, but on what grounds a man could set the law in motion and take advantage of the absolute liberty that he believed he had. So you have to know that. That's what's really going on in the questions. There were essentially two competing interpretations of what it meant, this indecency, this nakedness of a thing. Two schools, each whom had a rabbi who represented them. There was the school of Shammai, S-H-A-M-M-A-I, if you want to write that down, the school of Shammai. And, and that school, that rabbi and those who followed him interpreted the meaning to be something what they called a gross indecency. A gross indecency, and, and typically they called that an act of adultery, would be the gross indecency. 
But they included other activities as well, such as going outside with your hair unfastened, ladies. That would be the nakedness of a thing. That would be a gross indecency. Furthermore, they would say that bathing in the same place as men would be another illustration of a gross indecency. So this is the school of Shammai, the conservative school. The other school was the school of Hillel, capital H-I-L-L-E-L, was the rabbi. And he and his followers took the meaning of Moses in Deuteronomy 24 in the widest possible sense and basically said that you can interpret it as widely as you like. This is what it means. And so for them, for example, if your wife burned your dinner, that was grounds for divorce. Or if you saw another woman that you thought was prettier, that was grounds for divorce. So you can see how widely that school had interpreted what Moses' words were. But both schools considered it an absolute male prerogative to divorce their wife. And that's important that you know that. So, the school of Shammai was stricter than Hillel, but they both still permitted remarriage as well after a divorce, even if the divorce was obtained outside of their rabbinical interpretation. You need to remember that. Wherever divorce is spoken of, the assumption is that remarriage occurs thereafter. Now, divorce among the Jews of the first century had become very, very commonplace. It was very commonplace. The first century historian Josephus, you perhaps have heard of him, he was a Pharisee himself, and he writes in his own autobiography, and I quote him, that about which time he says, I divorced my wife also as not pleased with her behavior. So he just includes that in his autobiographical data. Josephus divorced his wife because he wasn't pleased with her. This illustrates the general prevailing opinion in the first century. Now under the Mosaic law, the commission of adultery was a sin punishable by the death of the offenders, both man and woman. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22 prescribes the death penalty for adultery. So although the law, though, prescribes this, in the mercy of God, it was not always carried out. For example, David and Bathsheba were not executed for the adultery. By the time of the New Testament, divorce had, instead of the death penalty, become the common response to marital unfaithfulness. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, Joseph, or Joseph rather, upon learning of Mary's pregnancy and being a righteous man, says that he contemplated divorcing her, not having her stoned. So this was the prevailing attitude and moral condition of the people in the first century. And we ought to be able to relate to that because it's so much like our own. Now there's one more background thing I want to say and then we'll begin to look at these passages. And I want to just loop back a little bit to something that was raised last week because I know it created a few questions. And that's the issue of whether something can be legal and not moral. Legal and not moral. Since the fall, God has permitted certain things as being legal that he does not desire and that are a transgression of his moral will. Okay? They're legal, but they are not moral and they are a transgression of his moral will, his moral desire. And the reason this is we live in this tension is because of human sin and weakness. Let me illustrate it for you. Slavery is something that was legal but not moral. And it occurred both in the Old and New Testament. Polygamy is something that was legal but not moral. And third, divorce. Something that was legal but frequently not moral. We need to be able to make and hold that distinction in our minds. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. We need to hang on to that. 
All right, so let's look at some passages. I'm going to turn you to Matthew chapter 5 first. What does Jesus say about a divorce and remarriage? That's what we're looking at. What does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, and it was this passage which got this whole series started. And when we finish, we will return to the Sermon on the Mount, I promise you. But there just seemed to be no way to properly deal with this without taking the time to look at it. Now, in this section, just as a reminder, because we've been gone from the Sermon on the Mount for a few weeks, and when you include Easter, indeed, a month and a half. So, re let's refresh a little bit about the Sermon on the Mount. This section of the Sermon on the Mount is to contrast the need for true inward righteousness with the outward, shallow, and hypocritical standards of righteousness that were prevalent among the Pharisees and thus among Pharisaical Judaism of the first century. You see it in verse 20 of chapter 5. I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's a discussion of what is true righteousness, righteousness acceptable before God. Jesus also says in verse 17 that, that his standards are not a repudiation or a changing of the law, but an exposition of the true intent of the law of God as it was originally given. So he is not adding to, Jesus is not substituting, taking away one set of laws and adding another set of laws. He is drawing out what was always there, at least implicitly, within the law of God. He's not adding to it. He's not abolishing it. He's merely drawing out what has always been there. In order to understand the section here as well, we need to, we need to kind of have this picture in mind. Jesus is speaking to the crowds, but on the fringe of the crowds, the Pharisees are gathered. And so Jesus will repeatedly say, you've heard it said, and he will point to the Pharisees, but I say, and then he will give a statement about the true intent of the law. So he is contrasting the, the understanding of the law that was prevalent in his day, which was external, shallow, hypocritical, works-based, and he is giving the true intent of the law all along. And so it's back and forth in this section. You've heard it said, but I say. Now, further, just to get us ready here, he has already dealt with the issues of, of true righteousness with regard to murder, beginning in verse 21 and following. And he speaks about anger, right? And murder originating inside the heart. And then he moves on to speak about adultery, and he says the same thing here. Adultery is not just about the outward physical action. It is about the attitude of the heart manifested through one's uh, approach to, uh, to another person that draws out what's really inside there. Outward action of adultery begins inwardly with a lustful stare at a woman. Jesus will now, and it's a natural transition, I think, to go from adultery to a divorce. He will now deal with the topic of divorce. And he will let us know that this also is really about an inward attitude of the heart. Not so much the outward action. So let's read what he has to say. It was said, and he points to the Pharisees, Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Immediately, we are drawn back to Deuteronomy 24. There's no avoiding it. It is always running in the background. And so, just to remind you again, let me turn you back to the Old Testament, back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, and let's read it again. Deuteronomy 24, and beginning in verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, 
And it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hands and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, since she has become defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance." So, Moses is describing what ha- is going on and he, is, and he is bounding it in. He is reining it in. And he's doing so for the benefit of the woman. Verses 1 through 3, he is just describing a situation that occurs. A man gets married. He loses interest in his wife for this reason of indecency. He properly, legally divorces her and he sends her out and she gets remarried. And if she then, her second husband, she's gone from him, however it happens, doesn't matter, divorce or death, the first man can't have her back. That's the law. The first one can't have her back. God denies permission for the first husband to remarry his former wife. Now, Pastor Vince spoke on this passage at length, and I'm not going to re-preach his sermon, but he, he told us the purpose of this law that Moses gave was to protect women. This was a law given by God out of compassion of his heart to protect women from a hasty de- decision of divorce from their husband and to protect her from being treated like chattel property where she can be handed back and forth between two men. God says that's not allowable. The problem is, is by the time we get to the New Testament, turn back to Matthew chapter 5 again. By the time we get to the New Testament, the original intent by, for which God gave this, this passage, this law, this restriction, has been lost. It's been lost. The true intent has now been obscured by a... a, a, a encrustment of interpretation by sinful men. And so what has happened is the Pharisees have turned Moses' description into a prescription and they have perverted the true sense of the passage. You see it in verse 31. Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. They have, they have externalized the law by this point in time, and they have, they have altered its focus from seeking to correct a weak view on marriage to a concern for the, formal, the formalities of divorce. So they've taken what was designed to, to restrict man's uh, freedom and his abuse of his wife, and they've turned it into a legal prescription. Whoever sends her away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Meaning, basically, make sure you do it the right way, the legal way. And what they were doing in practice by this time in the first century is they were, they were putting their former wives in a very precarious position. They were divorcing them in violation of, of God's design for marriage. And because the first husband had divorced her legally but on immoral grounds, they they are causing her, Jesus says here in verse 32, they are causing her to commit adultery when she remarries again. A woman of the first century having no other choice, legitimate choice, to to, uh, find care for her in life. They have put her in this very precarious position. So what is Jesus critiquing here? What is he criticizing? He is criticizing divorces that are legally correct, that is done by the book, with the question of whether it ought to be done in the first place at all. Despite having all the proper paperwork, this kind of an approach to to marriage and divorce amounts to nothing more than a publicly sanctioned adultery. And that is 
what had become prevalent in that culture, and it reveals the hearts of people who are very far from the kingdom of heaven. They're concerned about the externals. They're concerned about the legalities. They're concerned about doing it properly, that is, by the book, but they give no concern to whether they even ought to do it in the first place. Keep going to the right and turn to Luke chapter 16. We will make application of all of these at the end, okay? I need to build it together. So I'm going to turn you to Luke chapter 16 and verse 18, the next mention that I want to look at of divorce in the Gospels. Luke 16 and verse 18. One verse. Luke 16, 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. He who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Now, when you read this verse, at first glance, it appears rather random, kind of out of order, out of context with the surrounding material. The surrounding material is is about riches and the fact that riches are not a sign of God's favor. That's the context that surrounds this verse. So why would Jesus introduce a short statement on divorce in the middle of a discussion of riches? It just doesn't make a lot of sense on the, on the surface. The Bible is not a, just a collection of random sayings. The reason, you will see in a moment here. Now, look back up to verse 14. Here the, 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 is the introduction to the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which begins in verse 19 and carries out through the rest of the chapter. Lazarus and the rich man. It's introduced here in verse 14. And it says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And earlier it was a, it was a parable talking about the proper use of riches for one who is a follower of Christ. And they, it says, verse 14, they're listening to Jesus' teaching and they're scoffing at him. Because why? Well, because they love money. They love money. Jesus has just said in verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, right? He'll either hate the one or love the other. He'll be devoted to one, he'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And the Pharisees are snickering and saying, of course you can. We do it. Jesus, therefore, turns to these Pharisees and he begins to address them in light of their assumption that wealth is a sign of God's favor and and the favor has come upon them because they have so carefully kept the law. That's what's going on in their minds. Jesus says to them that their their system of external obedience does not satisfy God, but really amounts, according to verse 16, as an attempt to force your way into the kingdom. And so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to come into the kingdom on their own terms. They're they're forcing their way in, he says, verse 16. What it means is they're trying to enter the kingdom in their own way, holding on to their own definition of what righteousness is all about. Jesus illustrates this charge that they are attempting to force their way in by pointing to their teaching on the subject of divorce and remarriage. Verse 18. That's why he introduces it. It's easier, he says, for uh, heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail everyone who divorces his wife and so forth. What he is saying to them is that, that you Pharisees consider divorce as merely a matter of external legalities. And by doing that, you are in effect trying to change what never can be changed, which is the law of God. Verse 17, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than to change the law, and you're trying to change it by your your focus on the externals of the law. Riches, therefore, are not a sign, he goes on to say, of God's favor. Why does Jesus lift out divorce and remarriage to to illustrate his his, uh, accusation of them, his indictment of them? is because of the shambles they have made of Deuteronomy 24. 
They have completely externalized it. And so it's a, a very convenient, a very common, and a very easily understood illustration of how one can lose the true intent of the law, externalize it into behaviors, com- uh, satisfy those behaviors, and then assume you're righteous. And that's exactly what they're doing. So it's merely an illustration. Because it's merely an illustration, there are, it's, it's written, it's spoken in a very compact way in which there are no exceptions introduced. People always ask, well, how come, how come Matthew says except in the, in the case of immorality and so forth, and Luke doesn't? Here's your answer. It's because it would, it would lose the power if Jesus were to, to state this and then begin to give all kinds of caveats and exceptions. It would lose the power of the illustration. Communicators do this all the time, by the way. They speak in absolutes, very black and white, in order to make a point. And if you start to give all the exceptions, all the possible ways that what you've just said might not be true, you lose the power of the point. So he just states it here very simply, very straightforward, very powerfully to illustrate to them and everyone who's listening that you have merely externalized the law And a good place to see it is in the way you handle divorce. Now, go back to your left and go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19 is an extended treatment of the topic. Extended treatment of the topic. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19 and verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Now we need to set the context. Jesus is traveling, and you'll notice that it says, in the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. That is, to the east of the Jordan River. It's also called the land of Perea. He's traveling in the land of Perea. He is going to be in this region for the next three and a half months. He is here because he is seeking to avoid arrest by the Sanhedrin. Because they are out to get him following his confrontation with them over the Feast of Dedication, or what is known as Hanukkah, and the Gospel of John in John chapter 10 lays that all out. The confrontation is so intense at this point that Jesus has to leave, and He not only has to leave Jerusalem, He needs to leave Judea. He needs to get outside of the legal jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin where He can be safe because it's still three and a half months until the Passover comes, and He knows that He's not to die until the Passover. And so he has to run. And he leaves and he goes here. And this is under the jurisdiction of Herod. And so it is outside of the reach of the Sanhedrin. He will remain in Perea for three and a half months until right near the end, he will actually make a trip back into into Galilee. He'll hook up with some pilgrims. They'll cross over the Jordan River. They'll come down the east side of the Jordan River. They'll cross back over Jericho, up the uh, ascent of the Mount of Olives, and then down into the city for Palm Sunday. And that's the end. So for now, he's hiding out. He's here until the Passover comes, and it's time to die. Now while he's here, there are Pharisees that are continuing to chase him and continuing to try to trip him up. The Sanhedrin, their power structure is in Jerusalem. Pharisees are spread all over the place. So verse 3, he's here. It says, now, some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and he said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Well, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? 
He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. All right, back to verse 3. The Pharisees approach him, it says, to test him. You see it? To trap him. They are going to try to draw him into the controversy in an attempt to get him to say something that will discredit him with the people or, even better yet, get him in trouble with Herod who has married Herodias, his brother's wife, in an adulterous affair. John the Baptist criticized Herod for that marriage and ended up losing his head over it. So they are coming to him and they are trying to draw him into the dispute over the meaning of the indecency of Deuteronomy 24.1. Jesus, let us know. Here it is again, verse 3. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, here's the clause, for any reason at all? School of Shammai says that it's only these reasons. The school of Hillel says it's any reason you like. What do you say, Jesus? If you adopt the conservative position, you're going to alienate the crowd who, is, who is, uh, likes their prerogatives and freedoms. If you adopt the, the very wide approach, then you're going to alienate the conservative crowd. We have got you. And better yet, why don't you go ahead and criticize Herod's marriage, and then we'll really get you. So they're after him. They're not seeking information. They are seeking to trap him. They're seeking to trap him. Now a little earlier, back when we looked at Luke chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus has already charged the Pharisees in this region. Luke 16 and 18 occurs in this exact same geographical region. They have already, he has already accused the Pharisees of breaking the spirit of the law by their teaching on divorce. And so they're coming back at him, and they want to have another go at him. It's interesting. As I was thinking about this passage, it it reminded me of another situation that occurs a few months later when the Pharisees again try to trap him by making a statement that will make him unpopular with the people. Matthew chapter 22, don't turn there, verses 15 to 22 articulates that trap. That's when he is, on, he is in the temple during the Passion Week and they come to him and they say, tell us, Master, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? Do you remember that one? And they're trying to draw him into the controversy over whether it's legal to pay taxes to Rome or not. Now Jesus says to them in that particular Controversy, he avoids the trap, and in the process, he says to them, Yes, it is legal to pay your taxes, and you should pay your taxes. But he avoids the trap by, by calling for the coin. Do you remember? Somebody go get a coin that's used to pay the tax. They bring him the coin, and he, and he says, Whose picture's on it, right? It's Caesar's picture. And then he says, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Pay your taxes. But he says it in such a way that he avoids their trap. They are not able to draw him in. He he cloaks his answer while still teaching the truth. Well, here in Matthew 19, a similar thing happens. They are trying to draw him into the trap, and he avoids the whole discussion about what Deuteronomy 24.1 means by referring everything back to the original creation statements. He just completely over 
passes over Deuteronomy 24, and he goes back to Genesis, and he talks about God's true intent for marriage. That's the way to answer the question and avoid the trap. And so that's what he does. He talks about God's true intent for marriage. Now, at the end, he speaks about that only in the case of sexual immorality on the part of your spouse, there are moral grounds to free you to remarry without the sin of adultery. So he does say that. But notice how he approaches them initially. Verse 4. They try to draw him into the trap. They've set the trap. And verse 4, he answered and said, Have you not read? What a rebuke. He is charging them with ignorance of the Scriptures. Now, these are the ones who are supposed to be the keepers of the Scriptures. These are the teachers of the people. And he refers right back to them, and he says, Listen, you're the official guardians and interpreters of the Word of God, and have you not read what God said? In first, he quotes Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, and then he quotes Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. And he locates the whole discussion back where it belongs on the original intent of marriage. He completely avoids the discussion of the legalities. He doesn't want to talk about legalities. He wants to talk about the intent of marriage. There is a basis of divorce, he says, because we live in a fallen fallen world, and he gives that down a little bit later in the passage. But he avoids the entire controversy. They're not happy with his approach, and so verse 7, they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? So rather than than consider the implications of Genesis on the subject, the Pharisees resort right back to Deuteronomy 24.1 with the clear implication that divorce is their husbandly privilege. They quote it in an abbreviated fashion, and and they quote it in such a way that it, it points to what they believe are their husbandly rights. He says to them, verse 8, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. This is not God's intent. What Jesus says is that Deuteronomy 24 was given as a regulation on divorce because of the consequences of living in a fallen world. That's why God had gave it. It's necessary to regulate it because we live in a broken world. But for the Pharisees, they would rather discuss the the legalities, the, the legal technicalities, than to look back to the original creation account and understand the purpose of marriage and God's original intent. But Jesus is continuing to redirect them to the real issue, which is the hardness of the human heart, which makes divorce a sorrowful necessity in the first place. He says the problem is your hardness of heart. That's why it's there. Now, what does it mean to have a hard heart? Someone actually sent me an email question on that. What is the hardness of heart? Whose heart is hard? When it speaks of hardness of heart here, by the way, it's not speaking about hardness towards another person. That's not the way hardness of heart uh, communicates. It's not talking about our attitudes towards each other. It's not talking about being cruel or neglectful or so forth. That's not hardness of heart. Hardness of heart speaks of one's attitude towards God. That's what it means to have a hard heart is that your heart is hard in your attitude towards God. That means His purposes and instructions you have set aside. That's what it means to have a hard heart. The hardness here is is their stubborn rebellion against God and their deliberate determination not to abide according to God's will concerning marriage. God's will concerning marriage is abundantly clear in Genesis, but they don't want to do it. And so their hearts are hard towards God. Now here's the point we need, to, we need to make sure we lock in on here. The existence of divorce legislation is not a pointer to divine approval of divorce, but to human sinfulness. I have that for you up on the screens, because you need to, you need to read that and think about that. 
The existence of divorce legislation is not a pointer towards divine approval of divorce, but to human sinfulness that requires divorce in the first place. And so Jesus wants to root the discussion in Genesis, not in legalities. He goes on to say, verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The Pharisees are concerned about the man's right to initiate the divorce. Jesus' approach is to recognize that sometimes a marriage has already been broken because of the wife's actions in this case. And it is that alone which frees the divorce from God's judgment of legal but immoral. Except for immorality, he says, verse 9. Pornia is the word. This is a word that is a somewhat broad and flexible. Carries with it the idea of sexual sin in general. It's used that way in Colossians 3.5. It speaks of incest, 1 Corinthians 5.1. Speaks of prostitution, 1 Corinthians 6.13. Speaks of homosexuality, Jude 7. Speaks of sexual intercourse between unmarried people, Matthew 15 and verse 19. So you can see that it kind of is a bit of a broad word. And it says, except for the case of pornea. Except for the case of pornea. All of these components of that word speak of sexual contact between two people outside of the covenant of companionship. And so what Jesus is saying is that when the sexual exclusivity of the covenant of companionship has been violated, then on that basis, divorce is not only legal, but it is moral. It is moral. Verse 10. How does the crowd respond to this kind of teaching? The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. <laughs> they are men of their day, men of their time. They're saying that, listen, if, if, our, if we're going to be restricted that much in our prerogative, it's better not to get married in the first place. Now, we don't know the tone of voice that they said that. Maybe it was a joke. Maybe it was just cynical. We don't know. We have no idea the tone of voice in which they make this statement. But we do know this, that they understand what Jesus is saying, and, and they're responding back, and they're saying, listen, if it's like that, if once you get married, there's no way out. Maybe you shouldn't get married at all. Maybe you shouldn't get married at all. And Jesus says to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. This statement, what is that a reference to? It is a reference to, it is better not to get married. And Jesus says, not everybody can accept the statement that it is better not to get married. Again, I don't know whether they were joking. I don't know whether they were serious. It doesn't matter because Jesus takes it as a serious statement and he, and he builds some additional instruction from it. He uses their comment to, to teach that it should not be taken for granted that everybody ought to get married. Is marriage a normal state? Yes, it is. But it's not for everybody. There are or is an alternative. And Jesus says that this, this alternative is given to people. You see it, verse 11 at the end? Not everybody can accept the statement that it's, hey, you know what, if it's like this, marriage is one man, one woman together for life. Are you kidding me? Then maybe it's better not to get married. And Jesus says, not everybody can accept that statement that it's better not to get married. Only people to whom it has been given. It's a gift. It's a gift. The, the special calling of God, the gift of celibacy. It's the gift of celibacy. And it's given 
it, it, on the basis uh, uh, for a person to have greater usefulness in the kingdom of God. The only people that can accept the statement it's better not to get married are those people whom God has given a gift of celibacy. Very few people have that gift, by the way. Very few people. But there are some. There are some. Notice he goes on to speak of it here in verse 12. He says there are eunuchs who are born that way. There are eunuchs who are made that way by human hands. And there are eunuchs who make themselves that way for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He couldn't accept it. Let him accept it. He who has the gift, accept it. Some people are born. Some men are born without the ability to, to conceive children and, and get married. Others, at least in that day, were surgically altered because they were placed in positions of, of authority and guardianship over the royal wives, harem keepers. They're made that way by human hands, he says. But there's a third group. It is those who are, although physically able to conceive children, they refrain from marriage and children in order to totally devote themselves to the service of God. The Apostle Paul comes to mind. Go to the right, one more passage. Mark 10. And then we'll see if we can tie a bow around all this. Mark 10 and beginning in verse 1. I saved Mark 10 for last because Mark 10 is a passage parallel to Matthew 19. It's describing the exact same events. Verse 1, getting up, he went from there to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Crowds gathered around him again, and according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. It's the exact same event. Now listen. Neither Matthew nor Mark record everything that was said in that encounter. Neither one give us the entire picture. That shouldn't be shocking to us because that's the way it is in all of the Gospels. They give what, under inspiration, is necessary for the point they're trying to communicate. So to pit the two accounts against one another is destructive to the doctrine of inspiration. And I can't tell you how many books and articles I have read in the last month in preparation for this series from good evangelical expositors who find themselves doing just that. Terrible. We need to harmonize the accounts. Not say that Matthew added something to the words of Jesus or Mark took away something from the words of Jesus. Neither one gives a complete account. Mark doesn't report the actual question. Notice it in verse 2. Pharisees come up testing him and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. That is not the exact question. It's a, it's a summary, a, a substance of the test. Beyond that, we can notice down in verse 10, by the way, that, that Mark records a portion of the conversation that Jesus has with his disciples occur in the house. See that down in verse 10? In the house, the disciples began to question him. Mark, or Matthew's gospel doesn't have the in the house designation. Beyond that, in verse 12, Mark includes the further teaching in which a woman initiates the divorce. Verse 12, and if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Mark is the only one who phrases that, who, who, who records that portion of what Jesus says. Woman in, uh, initiating the divorce. Now why doesn't Mark have the exception clause that Matthew has? 
How about this? Jesus has already given the exception clause to the Pharisees in the hearing of the disciples. There's no need to repeat it again in his private conversation inside the house. I offer you a proposed harmonization of these two accounts as follows. It begins in Mark 10, verses 10 and following. In the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Then we slip over to Matthew Chapter 19, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He was able to accept this, let him accept it. Two conversations, two different places. Why did Mark write what he wrote? Well, Mark is writing to Gentile unbelievers. That's his audience. Gentile unbelievers who are under Roman law. And under Roman law, both the man or the woman could initiate the divorce. So perhaps that's the reason that Mark records the words that Jesus gave to the disciples privately in the house. Matthew is written to Jews. It's written to Jews. And for the Jewish audience, only the husband initiates the divorce. Perhaps that's why Matthew doesn't include that portion of Jesus' teaching. We don't know we're only attempting to harmonize the data. The stress of both passages is the same. It, it lies in the original intention for marriage back in creation. That's the big idea. That's the point. That's something that pagan unbelievers need to hear, both then and now. Marriage is God's idea, God's design, not man's. So if we want to understand marriage, we need to understand it as God understands it. Okay, let's see if I can put a bow around this thing in the few minutes that are left. You ready? So what? <laughs> right? You've been so patient, and it's hot in here. All right, let's see if we can address some so what's. I have three of them. Three lessons from this morning's study. Here they go. First one, the Bible is not a systematic theology, nor is it an ethics textbook. Now, you need to know that. You need to remember. You need to remind yourself of that reality. It is not a systematic theology, nor is it an ethics textbook. It is the story of the creation and redemption of the universe and the establishment of Messiah's kingdom. That's what it's about. We must derive our ethics and theology from Scripture's direct statements, necessary implications of those direct statements, stories which illustrate God's character and His dealings with humanity. We may derive theology, we may derive ethics from the Word of God, and we should. What this means is, when I say it's not a systematic theology or an ethics textbook, is that the Bible does not contain direct information on every single topic or situation that you will encounter in life. It provides the means by which we may know the mind and will of God and live in a way pleasing to Him. That's what the Bible is. That, by the way, is the reason the Bible is transgenerational and transcultural. That's the reason why a 2,000-year-old book continues to speak directly to human hearts today. Now, when the gospel writers record what Jesus taught on the subject of divorce, we should not assume that they recorded everything there was to say. It's a bad assumption. In fact, 
we know for a fact that 25 years later, the Apostle Paul addresses the topic himself. He feels compelled to further address the topic of divorce and remarriage and to add further revelation that was needed now, 25 years later, because why? Well, because the church age had dawned. And the pagans were flooding into the church and with them the problem of mixed marriages. And so the Apostle Paul adds to what Jesus has spoken. He does not contradict it. He adds to it. He expands upon it. So to take Jesus' words out of Luke 16, 18 and say this is what the Bible teaches about divorce is to do the Bible an injustice. It's to misrepresent God. So you cannot take any one statement out of its context and, and say this is the, fa- the last and final word on this topic or any other. It's the reason why we said we want to try to in four weeks look at what the Bible says in its totality. We need to be careful. We need to be thoughtful, we need to be prayerful, and we need to be compassionate as we attempt to draw biblical principles from the Scriptures to minister God's grace to those people who are presently in a situation where they see divorce as their only way out. It's easy to condemn. It's hard to minister grace. But we need to be in a position to minister grace, and, and we need to minister grace to people who are on the other side of what we're calling the nuclear option. And the way to do that is not by proof texting a verse here or there. Second, because of the fall of Adam and the entrance of sin into God's good creation, what God desires and what He permits are not necessarily the same thing. We don't want to lose sight of that. What he desires and what he permits are not necessarily the same thing. According to Jesus, God has made provision for a person whose spouse has violated the covenant of companionship by a failure to maintain sexual exclusivity in their marriage. But even in that terrible circumstance, God's first desire would be that the gospel of grace would enable the innocent party to be reconciled to their repentant spouse. That would be God's desire. Turn back to Matthew 19. I just want to show you something. Maybe this has occurred to you and maybe it hasn't. Did you know that Matthew 18 precedes Matthew 19? Did you know that? It's my first observation. Matthew 18 precedes Matthew 19. Matthew 18, in the second half of the chapter, beginning in verse 15, and then all the way to verse 35, speaks about the process of restorative church discipline and then an extended parable on forgiveness. Do you think it's just a coincidence? Is it just a coincidence that this portion of Matthew 18 precedes Matthew 19? I don't think so. I don't think so. You just finish reading about forgiveness and then you enter into the discussion of divorce. It's instructive. It's instructive. Listen, for those situations where reconciliation is not possible, we must willingly acknowledge the reality that all divorce is a result of sin, but not all sin, or not all divorce is sinful. We need to acknowledge that reality. God's desire through the gospel is repentance and forgiveness and restoration. But it's not always possible. Not always possible. All divorce is a result of sin. Not all divorce is sinful. Therefore, we must not make those who have been divorced assume a status of a second-class citizenship among the people of God. We are all sinners. Broken people. 
saved by the grace of God. We must never lose sight of that reality. Third, Marriage is not simply a human social contract which can be modified, renegotiated, or terminated by men. Now that is a countercultural statement, by the way. That is a countercultural statement. It is not simply a human social contract that people can negotiate any way they want to. Marriage is a creation ordinance given by God and subject to His rule and regulation. We will never understand marriage correctly until we understand it as God understands it. And when we understand it as God understands it, and when we we put into practice what God has given as His good gift to us, then the nuclear option of divorce becomes a remote idea. If I can say this to you, whenever we pose a question about what is lawful in terms of ending a marriage, we have already admitted defeat and assumed that divorce is now the only solution. And yet, how often do we do that? Is it legal to get divorced if the person does this to me? When we take that approach... We've already admitted defeat. We're now looking, we're like the Pharisees, we're looking for the legal way out. Instead of remembering what God has created, what He's put together, let's not tear it apart. Divorce should never be thought of as a God-ordained, morally neutral option. Divorce is the nuclear option. It's the nuclear option. It is the last resort, the last resort, when every other possible attempt has been tried and failed. And yet how often do we go to it right away? It is the hardness of our hearts. It's the hardness of our hearts. May God use His Word to conform our thinking to His. And that we might desire a righteousness that springs from the inside out. Not an external righteousness that is worthless in His eyes. Let's pray. Our Father, thank You for Your grace this morning to just see us through a lengthy teaching time. I thank you, Father, for your people who have endured even this time here. And and I pray, O Lord, that your Spirit would take His Word and the truth of His Word and would drive it deep within our hearts, that we would think about the things we've heard this morning and we would meditate upon them and by your Spirit they would transform the way we think about life and marriage. Our Father, we desire your glory in all aspects of our lives, and and yet at the same time we confess our helplessness, our desperate need of your grace. May you pour that grace out upon your people this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.